Assalamu alaikum, this is Muhammad Qureshi and you're watching The Real Agenda on UCTV. It's been 100 years, 100 Hijri years since the fall of the Islamic Khilafah. This last seat of the Caliphate was under the Ottomans. And exactly 100 Islamic years ago on the 28th of Rajab, that uh, era came to an end. So this is like the anniversary, if you will, of those hundred years. Today, my guest is Mazar Khan. Mazar Khan is a political activist, and he is a, a executive member of uh, the political party Hizb ut uh, Mazar's no stranger to UCTV. He's been on uh, UCTV before, and uh, I'm happy for him to join us on the real agenda and i'm going to let mother now introduce himself assalamu alaikum mother wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah i think you've introduced me there already so i'm not going to re-repeat what you, you just said that's fine so yeah thank you for having me on your show uh, no no problem jazakallah uh, for coming on so mother the we've not been without a khilafah for a hundred years. Why Khilafah? Why do we need one? Why do we need one? Um, how, how long have you got? <laughs> we could talk for hours about this. But but in short, I mean, maybe we can make two points about that. Why do we need it? Because a lot of people are actually unaware about the significance and the importance of the Khilafah. It's not just the Islamic political system. It's actually intertwined with our Islam at every level, from our ibadah all the way to, you know, declaring, you know, public statements by the Khalifa, whether it's a declaration of war, declaration of peace, but even our Jum'a, our Salah, our, our Hajj, is all in, interconnected, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later on. And secondly, why do we need it? I think we see the absence of the Khilafah today. So when you see what's happening to the Rohingya Muslims, when you see what's happening in Palestine, Kashmir, and people say, yeah, but brother, we had problems at the time of the Khilafah. Yes, we had problems at the time of the Khilafah. But these are so many problems happening one after another. And not only that, the problem we have today is, who do the Rohingyas go to? They can't go to Bangladesh, because it's not my problem. They can't go to the UN, not my problem. They've got no one. Kashmir, who do they go to? India? India wants to occupy them. Uh, go to Pakistan? Pakistan has almost literally wiped their hands off, off them. Go to the UN, UN's not bothered. So this is the problem. We've got problems upon problems and the Rohingya, the Kashmirs, the Palestinians, the Bosnians, all these issues that have occurred in the last hundred years, they've got no one to go to to resolve their problem according to Islam. And you see what's happening, you know, the insecurity and, uh, and the uh, corruption and all sorts of problems that are existing because of the absence of the, the, the Khilafah today. So that's the two points. One is our security and well-being. Mm -hmm. And the other is the fact that it's a way of enacting and fulfilling our respons uh, religious responsibilities, our ibadah even. So okay, those okay. are the two points. Excellent. Okay. Say. So uh, Khilafah is not just a few people. It's not just a group. It's a state. It's like a country level thing with a leader. Okay. Mm -hmm. With a political leader. Okay. So what religious duty do we have on, on the state level? You know, as a Muslim, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the believers as a collective in the Qur'an. Ya mm -hmm. ladina amanu, such and such. Ya ladina amanu, such and such. So we are all addressed. So that means we are all responsible for Islam, right? Each and every one of us is, is responsible for Islam. However, practically, how we discharge that duty is to appoint somebody from amongst the believers to apply the rules of Islam. So, you know, we have this concept in Islam of fardi kifaya. Like, we understand that when it comes to janazah. So yeah. if somebody from the community do the janazah, we know we are absolved of that sin because the rest, we the have rest to, do to do it. Yeah, we have to do it and a party has done it. So we have to rule by Islam. We can't all do it. So what the ummah does is collectively come together and appoint somebody to discharge that responsibility on our behalf. Because that's the other important thing about the khalifa is that it is a contract like any other contract, whether it's a marriage contract or it's a business contract. And the contract is, we will obey you on condition 
that you apply the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't do that, we've got no responsibility of obedience to you. And if you do do that, we are obliged to be obedient to you. So it is a important uh, 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 concept. It's an important thing that the, the, the Khilafah is, and that's there for us to discharge our duty. So we are responsible, but Islam has provided a practical mechanism in order to discharge the rules of, of how to implement the rules of the Sharia. Okay, so, but at the same time, that's, that's okay and I understand what you're trying to say. But today, look, things have moved on. You know, why would Khilafah be important today? You know, can't we just reorganize, have better leaders in our current countries? Because the world has moved on for, from the age of empires. We're now in nation states. And it just works completely differently to what it used to work 200, 300, 500 years ago. Which is actually quite ironic, actually, because we talk about, oh, the age of empires have gone, the Romans have gone, the, the, the Abbasis, the Ammawis, the Ottomans, the British Empire. The empire days are gone. Now we've got nation states, we've got tiny, tiny little countries like Dubai. You know, we've got tiny, tiny little countries like, you know, uh, Brunei, you know, which hardly you can find on the map. So because all oh, those days are gone. What is actually upside down is today is the day of empires because you've got mass communication, mass travel, uh, uh, means means of transportation, means of uh, 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 traveling. Um, you can go today from the UK and you can fly to America and you be there in the same day. You can fly from here to Pakistan. You can be in Pakistan in the same day. Never ever in the previous years was that possible. You had to travel for weeks and months. If you wanted to go to Australia, we're talking about maybe months of travel by ship and land to get there. So if they could achieve governance over huge swathes of land without technology, without transportation, then it should be a walk in the park to do it this, <laughs> to do it in nowadays. You know, and the thing is, we might not like that, but the world is forcing the, the borders, uh, countries to, to become globalized. So, you know, Britain's just done a Brexit and jumped out of Brexit. But the point is, Practically, they need it in order for trade to facilitate trade. Trade. They need to get rid of borders. They need to equalize the currency. They need to make so many things same so they can facilitate facilitate uh, travel, facilitate trade, and facil facilitate governance and exchange. So today is the most you know it's it's more needed today where the world comes together, different nations, different people, you know, different parts of the world under common systems and common practices to facilitate, you know, uh, interaction between people. So it's, it's funny that, that they had empires then, but somehow they're not suitable today. They're more suitable today than they ever were. But again, I don't want to put in the minds of the listeners and the viewers that Khilafah is an empire because it's not an empire. The Khilafah is a Khilafah. An empire is when one group of people dominate over another group of people. And the Khilafah is not that. Okay, elaborate. Why is the Khilafah different from an empire? Okay, very simply. And it's, it's quite uh, amazing this because you know what? The non-Muslims understand this very clearly. That, and there was a book I read many, many years ago and I've referred to it many times because when I read the book, it's like the book just slapped me in the face. I read this book and I thought, subhanAllah, this guy had just explained something so clearly that I understood, but I've never heard an Islamic book say this so clearly. And he was a professor from the School of Oriental and African Studies. And it was a book written after the first Gulf War, which you remember, you're old enough yeah. as me, as 1991, when the first Gulf War took place. And it was a dispute between Iraq going into Kuwait and saying Kuwait is part of Iraq. Mm -hmm. So these professors came together and they wrote this book about the borders and frontiers in the Middle East. And in short, the guy didn't say anything we didn't know. He goes, yeah, we do the borders. We created these countries. And he's going through the old Ottoman archives on the different wilayas and stuff. But the interesting thing in the book was a chapter about sovereignty. He goes, what is sovereignty? And he goes, in Islam, sovereignty is unique because sovereignty doesn't belong to a people or to a land. So he goes, the Islamic state doesn't have to be in any particular land. And we know that because the capital of the Khilaf from Medina, to Damascus, to Baghdad, to uh, Istanbul. So it doesn't have to be in a particular place. And he goes, no particular ethnic group is the dominant group. So the, the Khulafa were Arabs, and then the Khulafa became Turks, Europeans. 
So he says sovereignty doesn't belong to a land. Sovereignty doesn't belong to people. He goes, sovereignty belongs to the Sharia, to their Lord, Allah, to their religion. So that is sovereign. So the Khilafah, an Englishman could be a Khalifa if he is a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And the capital of the Khilafah could be anywhere in the world. That would be interesting. <laughs> but, but maybe inshallah one day, maybe, you know, they want to join us. Maybe they've done Brexit, but when they see the Khilafah come, they said, you know what? We want a bit of that, baby. That's fine simple <laughs> thinking at this point in time. But you know what? If the Khilafah is dominant and they're struggling to feed their people, you know, when they came begging to the Sultans in the day, when, you know, when they had the Spanish Armada, they yeah, came begging yeah. to the Sultan in Turkey, then all help us and protect us. Mm -hmm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of the world and things can change. And there will be a time when, again, Islam will be dominant and these countries who are powerful today will come begging for help. That's, you know, for a lot of people today, that's a hard thing to think because they look at our Muslim countries, they look at how impoverished they are, they look at the corruption uh, driven to the ground. Like, how can we get from that? You know, Any Liverpool supporter defining. will understand that. Any Liverpool supporter will understand that how great and mighty they were <laughs> and how they were yesterday. So, you know, <laughs> and this Ooh, is beautiful. I think you're despite a lot of our Liverpool supporters. Well, okay, let's bring Manchester in the city in it. You know, when Manchester were doing the triple, United, City were in the third tier of the English league, you know, and now look where they are. But the point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these examples of life, I know I'll give you like a, 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 a silly example of football. Mm. But greatness belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Mm. And whether you're a Muslim or not a Muslim, life is going to have ups and downs. Ups exactly. and downs, right? The Khilafah had ups and downs. The Ummah will have ups and downs. But the only victory is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And greatness only is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it shows us that we think we've achieved and then we fall down again. Just to teach you that only Allahu Akbar. So these lessons in life, even with the Khilafah state, is to show you that greatness is only with Allah. So if you want to be great, you know, submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will grant that to you. So Allah says that in the Quran as well, that, you know, he's promised the believers that, you know, uh, he's promised the believers when he says, amanu minkum wa amilu So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he's promised the believers authority on this earth. So that's a promise. It's going to happen. Whether we try and strive for it or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find somebody else. Nobody's got a divine right to establish a khilafah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to those people who are worthy of it. Eh? But nobody's got a divine right to do that. And he will select the people to do that. But we can try and, and try and be those people that he blesses, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Um, so in order to get to this goal of Khilafah, okay? Muslims are going to have to get their act together, yeah? They're going to get the think they need to get their thinking correct, they need to get their actions together. Uh, ultimately, they're going to have to unify. We need unity, and unity is difficult these days. People are divided nationally, uh, they're divided from national borders, they're uh, culturally, they have, um, you know, languages now as well, different, different languages, and also ultimately they don't agree they don't have the same points of view about islam they've got different schools of thought different islamic groups different sects how are you going to unify this bunch called muslims you, you, that's, that's a very good point and you know it's, it's surprising that this point comes up over and over again and sometimes i'm wondering is shaitan whispering into our ears because the evidence is blatantly in front of our eyes but we refuse to see it yeah, the evidence is in front of our eyes, but we refuse to see. But we still hark on about, oh, brother, there's so many sects, there's so many ethnicities, there's so many language differences. People don't agree with this in Islam and people are, how are we ever going to unite? The thing is this, my friend, the Khilafah is the thing that brings the unity. Without the Khilafah, you're not going to have unity, right? Two points to try and illustrate this. Number one, in Britain, you've got disunity. Labour Party is, is, you know, fighting with the Tory party. You've got people in Britain who are like Marxists. You've got people in Britain who are eco warriors. You've got so many differences on economics, on ecology, so many differences. People differ, right? There's no two English guys that agree on everything. Mm -hmm. Yet they've got one country, one state, one ruler, right? In, as a nation state, yeah. right? Because that's what causes a unity. And how does it cause unity? Like, 
we don't agree with the, with, with the English people on certain things. We might not agree with the Welsh people on certain things. We might not agree with the Christians on certain things. But when Boris Johnson says, close your masjid down, you're not praying Juma, we close our masjid down and we don't pray Juma. That's how unity is achieved. When you've got authority, you don't have to agree with him. You don't have to like him. Hmm. But if you've got the authority, that's what creates the unity in that state. So if you don't have a leader, you're not going to have unity. Right. And the point about even in Britain, they've got different political views about I mean, even democracy. French, hmm. French democracy doesn't agree with British democracy. British democracy is different to the American democracy. American de democracy is different to the Italian democracy. So, so, so are, you telling me, are you telling me we have political schools of thought? <laughs> Very much so. But the point is, you never ever hear somebody, oh, brother, how can we achieve democracy? Do you want a federal democracy? Do you want a parliamentary democracy? Do you want, you know, what kind of democracy? No, we're going to have it the, the way we see it and we'll, we'll work with it. That, but, that's quite uh, interesting because I've got a, a different take on this kind of discussion, which I think we will continue, inshallah, after the break. So we'll be back soon, folks. Okay, folks, welcome back to the show. Our guest today, as I mentioned, was uh, Brother Mazar Khan. Right, Mazar, before the break, we were talking about uh, unity and that really, we really don't have unity and we're split up and, you know, we've you know got different sects and everything else. And you gave that example of, you know, we have different political parties. We have different political schools of thought, if you want to call it that, uh, different points of view on how a country should be run, how our lives should be run. But we accept whoever's the prime minister, for example, Boris Johnson here or wherever, whoever's the leader of the country, when they have that authority and they uh, lay the law down, everybody, whether they like it or not, have to conform okay that may be fine but then you do get this extra now now you get this this it seems to be extra fervor when we have this debate amongst muslims that you know they wouldn't tolerate a leader who was from a different school of thought to them you know they won't accept a, a you know a shafi imam or a hanafi imam or a uh, you know or a tabliki imam uh, you know caliph or a you know, a, a Salafi Khalif, or because we're not from that school of thought, we can't accept, accept that. So, I mean, the thing, the thought that comes to mind, and uh, this is what I want you to comment on, is look, 100 years without Khilafah, we've tolerated, whether we like it or not, we've tolerated 100 years of non-Islamic rule, pseudo-Islamic, if you want to call it that, in some places, kingdoms, monarchies, oppression, torture, you know, some of these regimes are the most despotic we've ever seen, and, you know, throwing, torturing people, killing people, uh, ulama in prison, you know, people try to raise their voices, you know, armies come in and wipe us out, uh, you know, in places like Egypt, and, you know, we saw a lot of things during the Arab Spring, in, you know, in Syria, in Egypt, in North Africa, uh, you know, as this thing, thing. So, Muslims tolerated that, and that's not even a Khilafah. These people aren't even Khalifs. Yet we're bickering over what kind of Islamic ruler we should have or not. I mean, what do you have to add to that or comment on that? Yeah, no, like we said before the break. I mean, that's why I think it's just like whispers from Shaitan because the evidence is in front of your eyes mm. in a day-to-day -day fashion. You've got all these divisions that doesn't affect the running of the governance in the state today. So why would it be any different if it happens to be an Islamic state? So one thing to add uh, to, to this discussion is 
the Khalifa or the Khilafa state is the mechanism Islam has given to resolve disputes. You are not going to get rid of disputes other than that. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum had many disputes amongst themselves. Many disputes, well recorded and documented in our books. But it was the Khalifa, when the dispute affected this, the unity of the Ummah, Islam has given the Khalif and only the Khalif the right to, uh, to, uh, to oppose, to, to implement an opinion or to select an opinion and everybody's duty bound to follow. That's what gets rid of disunity. Today, no Imam, whether he is a Deobandi, Barelwi, Aladi, Salafi, whatever uh, uh, fiki spectrum he comes from, no Imam, forget the fiki spectrum, even your own local masjid, the Imam has got no authority over you to enforce an opinion on you. Whether it's about what time are you going to pray Asr, are you going to do this shadow or, or one and a half shadows, two shadows, um, you know, there are so much ikhtilaf, you're going to do Rafi Adain or you're not going to do Rafi Adain. No Imam, no scholar, no mujtahid has got the authority to force you to follow an opinion except the Sultan, the Khalifa. So that is the way to resolve disputes. So if you, like at the time when, at the time of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anh, there was there was a dispute about three talaq, is it one talaq? When Abu mm -hmm. Bakr became the Khalifa, we're not going to go into the whole dispute because it's quite nuanced yeah. and stuff. But the point is when Abu Bakr was the Khalifa, he said, um, uh, he said, oh, three talaq is one talaq. When Umar radiallahu anh became Khalifa, people were abusing that. He said, no, you say three talaq is three talaq. All bets are off, you're divorced, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you agree or disagree, it doesn't matter now. The Khalifa has adopted an opinion. So that is the mechanism Islam has provided to resolve disputes. Without that, you will never resolve disputes. And again, if you look that people think, oh, brother, you know, there's so much dis dis disunity amongst us. We don't like, you know, this, this group of Muslims and the group of Muslims don't like another group of Muslims. How much worse could he have got? Uh, how much more worse could it have been today then compared to the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq and people are going to take a st step back now and say what are you talking about we're talking about Khilaf Rashida we're talking about the, the best of the best people that existed yeah. you know Abu Bakr we, the, the we, best we man to exist that was the Rashida period, period, period of yeah. Khilaf Rashida yeah but not just the Khilaf Rashida Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, is the best man ever to walk on this earth after the NBA. Uh, I guess 100% yes. but look at his time when he became the Khalifa People were mocking and abusing him. They said, no, no, you are like, you're like a nothing. You know, they used to, I forget what they used to mock him. They said, you know, this, his name was like Abu Bakr, you know, the father of the lively camel. Mm -hmm. They said, no, you're the, you're the father of like a lame camel or something. And um, so they said, we're not even going to give you zakat. Our agreement with, was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We didn't give you, agree to give you zakat. What are you going to do about it? Right? Then you had three false prophets. And in some narrations, it says that most of the people became murtad, other than Mecca, Medina, and Ta'if. That's the crisis. That is a problem of unity. That is not just a problem of which madhab you follow. They have left the fold of Islam. They have become murtad. Mm. But Abu Bakr Siddiq didn't say, oh, we need to refresh our aqidah. We need to refresh our iman. We need to go into the sunnah. We need to do tazkiyah. We need to do this. We need to do that. No. The institution of the Khilafah existed and he used the institution of the Khilafah to resolve those problems. And that's why in those two years when he was a Khalifa, he stabilized the whole of the Arabian Peninsula, united the people behind the Khalifa. That's why when Umar radiallahu and came, he was able to expand the state into the Roman territories, into the Persian territories, into North Africa. So if you're talking about we are not suitable for the Khilafah, then the time of Abu Bakr was worse than our time because they left Islam. Okay, maybe today the Muslims are not so pious. Maybe the Muslims are not, you know, doing all the things they're supposed to do. Maybe the Muslims are cheaters and liars, yeah? But at least they haven't become murtad en masse like they did at the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Right? There you, have it for you can go to Pakistan, you can criticize the people in Pakistan much as you like. But you know yeah. what? Most of them, even to the current, and I've got personal experience of that, even the corrupt ones, they'll draw a line. You don't insult the Prophet. Yeah, you don't mock the, they might not pray themselves, yeah. but you don't mock the deen. They might not pray themselves, but when the azan goes in the masjid, they will respect it. It shows you they've got emotion for Islam. Mm -hmm. The Arabs at the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq abandoned Islam altogether. altogether. Mass he was able to have khilafah over people like that. 
I think we are able to have Khilafah over people like the people we have in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Syria, Saudi, wherever. We are much more able to do that. But we need broader agreement now because obviously there's the Ummah is like considerably the, the size of the Ummah is a lot more than it was then. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we are over several established entities across the nation states, different countries. They, they recognize, okay, even if, even if as a, from a strict Islamic point of view, you might say, I don't recognize that. It's not Islamic. That we, you know, Islam didn't say put a border there. But from an international norm, that's a border. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the way we're going to deal with these problems, the, the nature is going to be considerably different, don't you think? There's two points here. One is, do we need Khilafah? Yes. Is an obligation? Yes. How will it happen? That depends on the reality of the time, right? So, but when it does come, it's not going to suddenly come bang, all of the world is the Khilafah. No, mm-hmm. it will start off in one piece of land, right? It will start off at one place. Mm-hmm. But then the focus and the objective of the Khilafah becomes to annex all the Muslim land over a shorter period of time as possible. What do you mean when you say annex? Mazar, come on. Annex is to delete that uh, lines the, the, the colonialists left behind, basically. But nobody just accepts a deletion. <laughs> They, they will believe, believe because these are fake and false entities. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we, we, we began the show talking about, um, I don't know if it was off uh, before the program started, but we talk about the, 1990, the 1991 Gulf War, the first Gulf War. Yeah, no, that was part of it, yeah. The, the oh, what happened right. across the 100 right. years, yeah. As soon as the Sabah family thought the Iraqis are coming, they were out of the country. Their plane was ready on the tarmac. They were out and they were on their way to America or wherever. And they left the country. I was, at that time, when that happened, I was in Egypt. This is back in 1990, when Saddam Hussein went into Kuwait. Kuwait, We saw a demonstration in Cairo. And I was backpacking. I was a student in them days. And we're we're asking the people, what's going on here? What's this demonstration? And then we asked some uh, footman at the hotel. And he goes, oh, uh, it's uh, uh, Kuwait has been taken by Iraq, and these people are demonstrating. And there were these Kuwaitis dancing in the street, playing loud music and chatting up women in the street. Right? That's another story. But the point is, yeah, they were, you know, they left. And we talk about, oh, but brother, what about border? Let me tell you something about borders. You know, we think, oh, how can Syria join with Iraq and Iraq join with Saudi and Saudi join with Yemen? I'll tell you something. You know, Germany and France, Yep, they fought on the opposite sides in two world wars. Twice France, I think twice they were occupied by Germany. Definitely one time, right? Yeah. And if I'm if I'm not mistaken, in Europe, I think they had a hundred day war, which was again primarily between France and Germany. They've got a lot of beef between France and Germany over the years. They they, they fought one another. They've had rivalry. Today they are united. Same currency, same EU, same. Uh, uh, movement of people they can live so if the non-muslim who have got hundreds of years of hatred and hundreds of years of different history if they can come together don't tell me that muslims who speak this like in iraq and, and, and jordan and syria who speak the same language got the same culture got the same ethnicity got the same deen got the same everything they can't come together that just goes to show how intellectually weak you've become that the non-Muslims have told you, you can't. You can't. But Islam came to tell us we can. Because Islam came to... Is that what we're looking at, though? Are we looking at an an Islamic version of the European Union? No, absolutely not. We're not looking at the Islamic version of the European Union. All I'm talking about on that aspect, the reason I gave that example is, if two countries can come together who have got a history of enmity, can come together for political reasons, Mm -hmm. then... There is a greater and easier uh, 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 um, chance of Muslim countries coming together. Because you're talking about borders. I mean, most of these borders are fake. You know, like, for example, somebody born in Dhaka, yeah. right, in 1920 was an Indian. Right. He gets married. He has a son. In 1950, he has a son. His son is Pakistani. His son grows up. He gets married and he has a son. In 1975, he's Bangladeshi. They haven't even left the house. Yeah, because the borders have shifted. And India's in the bad, Pakistan's in the bad, Bangladesh is in the bad. 
नॉनसेंस जिंदाबाद फेक बोर्ड जिंदाबाद इल्यूशन जिंदाबाद आवर आइडेंटिटी कम्स फ्रॉम व्हाट अल्लाह गेव अस वी टेक द कलर ऑफ अल्लाह सिबगतुल्लाह एंड वी कलर आवरसेल्स विद द कलर अल्लाह गेव एंड रसूलुल्लाह सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम केम टू रिमूव ट्राइबलिज्म ही केम टू रिमूव बॉर्डर्स एंड दैट्स व्हाई द अर्ली मुस्लिम्स वर कॉल गुरबा दे वर कॉल गुरबा बिकॉज़ दे वर स्ट्रेंजर्स बिकॉज़ दे सेड वी डोंट आइडेंटिफाई विद आवर ट्राइब we identify with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the message he has brought so people found that strange and there's a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said islam came as a stranger and it will return as something strange, strange yeah so when we say that now people say oh brother but how can it be i've got my own country and I've my own border well you were you were fulfilling this prophecy that the prophet said that people will find islam strange again okay that's true I mean, there is a hadith about the uh, islam returning as something strange there's also mm-hmm. another one that's off cited which is that every 100 years allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send a mujaddid a reviver to 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 revive the deen yeah 100 years is the length of the absence of the khilafa yet are we not due a, a mujaddid a mujaddid a reviver to come and restore the khilafa for us no a mujaddid comes every 100 years every generation a mujaddid will come and the the qualities of a mujaddid is that he brings back something or he revives something that has gone dead mm-hmm. so when we look over the years you find certain scholars who are called mujaddid only allah knows alone who these mujaddids are mm-hmm. but they are people that have come into our time so if you look people like imam ghazali i don't know if he was or he wasn't mm. but there are many people who counted some of the evil thoughts or corruption that came into the deen and they cleaned it so yeah. when you had the mu'tazila islam was clean from that when they had the zindiqs islam was clean from that so whenever there's a challenge that comes allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises somebody amongst the ummah who can take on that challenge mm-hmm. so one thing we have lost today for sure and that became forgotten was the concept of the khilafa but now we are reviving that so that is something that was lost and that has something that the ummah is now talking about so Yes those ideas have been revived but it's not about the khilafa state being a mujaddid because the khilafa state might not come for another m- many years so it's not about the state that there must be a khilafa state within the 100 years there's no condition it's about the mujaddid so allah will send somebody to clarify and i noted how you just said many years there not a hundred more years uh, almost as if there was wishful thinking you want this khilafa to return in your life i am i am honestly i am very hopeful <laughs> i am very hopeful and very confident that it's going to happen soon in our lifetime i really think inshallah that. inshallah, Because, inshallah so before you continue there was uh, uh, we had brother jangi mohammed a, a few shows ago in back in january with a similar discussion but of of unity and obviously his organization is doing uh, good work in different ways in a you know at a different level but i'm going to treat you both equally with this next question yeah mm-hmm. mother come on man isn't imam mahdi going to come and sort this khilafa out for us what we why can't we just wait for imam mahdi um you know i you're right it's a very common point that people raise and what surprises me is why do they say that why do they say that because where does it say in our hadith or the quran or or, or islamic you know sources that imam mahdi is going to come and establish the khilafa or imam mahdi is going to come and do this and that yes it talks about imam mahdi coming and, and doing certain things but about the khilafa where does it say that If you actually look at the hadith speaking about Imam Mahdi one of them actually says that when a khalifa dies and there is a dispute in the ummah and there's like they're on the verge of having a fight a man goes from Medina to Mecca and when he's making tawaf he is identified and the ulama of Mecca will say no you are the you are the Mahdi and then they convince him and he goes yeah okay uh, you're right I'm the Mahdi. then he accepts and and uh, then the army from syria comes because they reject it mm-hmm. and the ground opens up and swallows it yeah. so the point is so just 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 to cover myself he's paraphrasing yeah yeah i'm just i'm just you know paraphrasing so the point here is that the hadith that actually talks about imam mahdi talks about the khilafas already existing the yeah. khila- khalifa already exists already it's existing. when one dies and there's a dispute so imam mahdi doesn't establish a khilafa so if you want imam mahdi to come establish a khilafa and that's another milestone you've got to cross and then, then it's going to come 
So that's one point. The second point is this. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said certain things are going to happen. But yeah. that doesn't mean you wait for them to happen. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu knew that Persia and Istanbul were going to be conquered. They didn't wait for it to happen. They made it happen. You know, Sahaba themselves were trying to go to Istanbul. So many attempts were made to conquer Istanbul, maybe 19 attempts. And Muhammad al-Fati was the victor. He didn't say, oh, let's wait for Imam Mahdi. When the crusaders came, but nobody said, people probably said, we'll wait for Imam Mahdi. And the ones who said, kept waiting until Salah al came along, right? Mm -hmm. Even Imam Mahdi, listen to this one. Even Imam Mahdi knows who comes after him. Isa alayhi salam. Alay salam. So this Imam Mahdi goes, you know what? I'm here. The next guy, next person to come along is Isa alayhi salam. I'm going to wait for him. <laughs> He's the one who can fight the jal. I can't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually says that Nobody can defeat the Jal except Isa bin Maryam alayhi salam. Yeah? Um, if, I mean, if I'm mis not mistaken, there's some reports that even Imam Mahdi would go to war against the Jal, even though Isa... Yeah, I know, the, the, the narration. But I'm, I'm, I'm taking yeah, with this yeah. one because this counters the point they're saying. And they say that Imam Mahdi is getting ready for Salatul Fajr. Yeah, yeah. The Iqama is given. Why? Because they're about to fight the Jal. And then Isa alayhi salam descends from the sky. Imam Mahdi did. Why did Imam Mahdi go to all that attempt? He's ready to fight Dajjal. He knows he's going to come. We're going to fight. And he's saying to the people, right, pray, and we're going out. And Dajjal's waiting outside. Not once in any of the narration did he say, oh, but Imam Mahdi said, relax, guys. Isa alayhi salam is coming. But so on, where but do we get this mindset from that but, we can wait? But surely no, no. Imam Mahdi knows that he needs to do the karma for Isa alayhi salam to come. But the point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling of what is happening, but it shows you the actions Imam Mahdi is doing. Though we have I mean, to, to do put it, put it down even more simply. Put, put it down even more simply. It wasn't the real reason people are saying, let's wait for Imam Mahdi is because they don't want to do anything. Allah is the judge of that, but it, it is a cop out. It's an excuse because you know, when it comes to Imam Mahdi, you don't apply that to your business. You know, well, my business is doing real well. Imam Mahdi will come and sort it. No, you make attempts for that. You know, when your kids want education and want to get jobs, you don't say Imam Mahdi will come and give them jobs. No, you educate them. You send them to university. You know, you invest in your, in your children. You invest in your houses. You don't say Imam Mahdi is going to come and build me a palace. You invest. In so we do everything for life. Imam Mahdi doesn't come in. And when Allah has given us a duty to do, we say, oh, Imam Mahdi is going to do it. Subhanallah. So it is an, an element of cop-out that we just, anything we find too difficult to do, we put it in the Imam Mahdi box. No, we have to do what we are responsible for. Whether we achieve it or not, that's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to determine. But we are still responsible to do what we can to fulfill our obligations. Jazakallah. So earlier on in this discussion, you mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will grant the victory for Khilafah. It will happen to whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, whichever group, group of people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deems worthy of it. Okay, mm -hmm. there's different groups with different approaches, different methods, yeah, who've using this Khilafa slogan that we want to implement the Khilafa. Yeah, we've we've heard it uh, uh, more and more as time has gone by. We probably never heard it, you know, decades and decades ago. But recently, we've we've heard it, you know, in the last ten years, for example, you know, from from across across the board that Khilafa. You know, we've got calls in Pakistan. We've got calls uh, from yourselves in Hizb Tahrir. We've got people who take up arms and come under the banner, saying their their end goal is the Khilafa. But they've all got different ways of doing it. They've got different opinions on how how to get there. Okay. Is this area of legitimate difference of opinion or is there is there one way? There can be legitimate differences. There can okay. be. Yeah. And the, 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 the legitimate differences can occur if the scholars go to the, the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, to the hadith, to the Quran and study it to come out to find out how do we do it. And if they do that and they come out with an answer, then you have to respect that. Yeah. You have to respect that whether you agree or disagree with it. You follow the one you believe is the strongest or the one you trust. Right. But that's a legitimate difference. 
I would argue to say, other than Taqiyuddin Nabahani, who did ijtihad on the issue and came up with a particular way, right? So I would say we're duty bound to follow that way because that is a legitimate way. Now you can criticize it. You can say there's this thing wrong with it and that thing. That's fine because it's a human endeavor. The ijtihad is a human endeavor. endeavor, So people can criticize that. But in the absence of anything else, Mm -hmm. right, that has to be a a way or the way to establish a khilafah. Now, when people talk about using, you know, wishful thinking, well, wishful thinking is not going to bring khilafah. Mm -hmm. If somebody said, let's use jihad, yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, that is an opinion that people have, but it's not derived through ijtihad because jihad has got a specific role in Islam, right? And that is to defend and, and for offensive purposes. It's for the state to do. Every state has an army. Every state uses military in order to achieve certain objectives. The Khilafah is no different. And this is where the rules of jihad come. Islam is not a free for all religion where I can start taking responsibility of the state. I can't create my own army and start fighting for whatever I want, right? I can't start collecting the income tax and the VAT like in Britain. If somebody went out there collecting income tax and VAT, they said, who are you? Same with Islam. I can't go and collect in, you know, zakat on behalf of the Khilafah. The Khilafah collects the zakat. So the jihad uh, is there for use and it's, it's got its rules. Okay. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not use physical means to establish a Khilafah. He did not fight in Mecca. He did not even uh, 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 fight in order to establish the Khilafah in Medina. So jihad is, has got its role and it's got its rules in Islam but it's for protecting, defending, and promoting uh, uh, and expanding the boundaries of the state. It's not for establishing. So that's that's how I would we would disagree uh, about saying that yeah, jihad. I'm sure, is a I'm sure they would disagree with you as well. Yeah, they would. They would. <laughs> but let's move on from that. We're talking to you, and you're representing his Mr. Harris. So obviously, that's a stance you take. So essentially, you're saying it's a political effort. It's a non-violent effort to reach that goal. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's a not it's a it's a non-violent political method because you know even the the, the brothers who, who who have this uh, militaristic view on establishing khilafah they will say that oh if the, the ruler doesn't rule by Islam you can kill him right mm-hmm. and people have done this in the past you know the famous incident was with Anwar Sadat when he signed the peace treaty with the with the Zionist occupier state right? yeah if he gets assassinated who replaces him just another president would come because this is it because the system is still in place. You need to understand the context of the ruling. So if you do have an Islamic state mm. and the corruption emerges in the leader, if you remove the leader, you have protected the state. It's like if you've got gangrene in your leg. Just, just a caveat, we're not endorsing assassinations. We're just describing what happened in the past yeah. and what other people do. So the thing is, if you've got, if you've got like gangrene on your foot, if you yeah. chop the foot off, you protect the body. But if the body is dead, chopping the foot off is not going to revive the body. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a non-Islamic state, by killing the leader, he's not going to revive the Islamic state because the institution's not there. The state doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Killing the leaders doesn't bring the state back. And this yeah. is what there's a confusion in the minds of certain people. And we saw that when Anwar Sadat was knocked off, we got something worse. Got we got something worse in the form of Mubarak. Much more oppressive and tyrannical. Excellent. So, okay. Yeah, that's why I would disagree with that. And, you know, we, history yeah, yeah. has yeah. also illustrated that, that that is the case. Okay, so... Um... That's with the different approaches. Okay, there's other people who like, okay, let's just use the system. Let's go through the ballot box. There's other people who say, okay, well, if we just all become, you know, more educated, more professional, more uh, good at what we do, good doctors, good thingy, you know, we can all come together. We'll have something more uh, attractive, more appealing to, to come into. There's 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 all sorts of approaches, all sorts of theories. I mean, I wouldn't call them which they had as well, but there's a lot of theories out there about you know, what we could do that would be, be conducive to unity, should I put it, if nothing else. I, I, I'll tell you why I, I smile, <laughs> because it reminds me of an incident that took place maybe 25, 30 years ago. Okay. I was in a, a, a Islamic society, I was in a university in the, in the prayer room. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a dart, and then we just prayed Salatul Maghrib. And we're just having ch- chit chat, and there was a student from Malaysia there, and he was going, I'm studying hard, I'm doing jihad with my studies. I'm going to be the best engineer for the sake of Islam, right? And people think, Subhanallah, Mashallah, he's got good near, he's got mm-hmm. good near. And another guy will say, I'm going to be the best doctor for the cause of Islam. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, at the time, I thought, you know what? This is just, it, it's just like, it doesn't add up. I, I didn't know how to respond to the guy at the time. Mm-hmm. And he says, no, if you become the best doctor, the best engineer, the best mechanic, the best architect, yeah? 
It's not going to do nothing for Islam. Mm, mm-hmm. The world is full of doctors and architects. And these guys come from Malaysia. Malaysia, alhamdulillah, in terms of Muslim country, is probably better developed, better, you know, uh, technologically and economically than many other countries. Doesn't bring Islam. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Doesn't bro- hasn't brought Islam. So there is this thing about, oh, if we better ourselves. So if you educate your kids, inshallah, we'll have better Muslims. Yeah, you'll have better Muslims who get better jobs. It's not going to bring you khilafah. It's just going to get better jobs. Okay. So look. Now, in, working in the, through the system, hmm. right? We can talk. I could talk for hours on this one and give you example after example. But let me give you two current examples. Yeah. That we've, we've all witnessed to okay. show you, right? Forget Muslims trying to change the system. The system has a constitution which protects the system. You cannot go outside that constitution. The constitution is there to preserve and protect that system. You will never be able to change it from within. Okay. So now in Pakistan, yeah. Imran Khan has gone there trying to realize his Medinan state. Yeah. And he's virtually done everything he said he wouldn't do. Now, I'm not blaming Imran Khan's sincerity or intention or anything like that. But the point is, right? maybe he was extremely naive, mm-hmm. right? giving him uh, benefit of the doubt. Let's say he was naive. He has not been able to achieve what he wanted to do because that state will not allow him to do that. So on the, the other side... The system was we, in Pakistan is rigged against him. Yeah, the system's not going to allow those who are powerful and the system benefits. They'll make sure that the system stays as it is. All right, your second before, example, yeah, before, before I interrupt it. Before you, yeah, like, forget the Muslim world. If we look at Donald Trump, president of the, the America, uh, America yeah. president of America, he tried now to do things which were beyond the pale, trying to change the system, right? And he was stopped and, and, and booted out. Okay, his term finished, but they tried to uh, think him, what do they call it, impe- impeach him as well. So, he's go- so if the president of America can't do what he, what he wants, and if Imran Khan, as the prime minister of Pakistan, can't do what he wants, how do you think your local councillor and backbench MP is going to bring Darul Islam <laughs> through a democratic system? Yeah, but Mazar, I'm going to ca- catch you on something now. Go you you picked two very easy examples. <laughs> what about Caliph Erdogan, who's gradually changed the constitution? He's even extended his term as president constitutionally. Surely he can bring Khilafah. He's even, you know, according to some scholars, he's a Mujaddid. Yeah, yeah, Mujaddid. You know, it's interesting you should mention that. Do you know Erdogan is the longest serving leader of Turkey in his entire history, even more than Ataturk? Whoa. Even more than at the time. paying attention powerful. to the length of term. Close to 20 years. If you've not able to achieve in 20 years, you know, basic fundamental, basic changes in your state, how much more longer do you need? And the thing is, if you look at Ataturk, mm-hmm. you know, the devil. Yeah. He destroyed the Khilafah. He didn't have majority vote for that. No. He didn't even have the support of the people because people, his own party rebelled when he expelled the Khalif. He own secularists, they said, no, you've gone too far. Gone too right? far. He did all of that because he wanted to do it. Mm. Right? Mm. The, and uh, no doubt the Kufar were behind him as well, the British and stuff. He mm. wanted to do it. He didn't need 20 years. He didn't even need one year. He managed to do that within a tiny space of time. And you've had 20 years where the majority of the people in Turkey support you. Mm. The majority of the people want Islam. The majority of the people are Muslim. And you can't do that with majority people. Even a lot, even if it's not majority, there's a large segment of that society who are pro-Islam. Right? Some, some would have us believe Mustafa Kamal did it with one phone call from London. Um, I, the thing is, look, they've been working there for a while, but the thing is, it was a small number of people that Ataturk had around him. Mm-hmm. Right, who were hardcore Kamalists, secular atheists. Yeah, they were called, they were atheists. Many of those around uh, Kamal Ataturk was, and I'm sure many around him were. But the others were hardcore secularist nationalists. With a few people that did that, and the people didn't want it. Mm. The people didn't want the, the Khalifa to be expelled. The, the people didn't want the, the institution of the Khilafah to be uh, abolished, and he did that. So how can you not do it? When not only you've got the support of the people in t- Turkey, you've got support of people in Pakistan. You've got people of support in Syria. You've got support of people around the world. If, if Erdogan declared the Khilafah, yeah, he would have the whole world supporting him and you'd find thrones falling. 
you would find thrones falling. Really? I would believe so because the, the, the energy would come back to the ummah that now we are on the up. And well, the leaders yeah. would know, mm-hmm. right? They would know because all these monarchies only exist because of outside support. And once that threat of the outside support is cut off, they will finish. It's like, well, it's like when, the, when, the demonstrators, the, if when the demonstrators demonstrated in Tunisia yeah. Yeah. T- t- 10 years ago, you know, that guy flew off to Saudi Arabia straight away because he knows he doesn't have support base in his country. Yeah, yeah. And you find that with the, the Kuwaitis. When Kuwait was it, they flew to America. So they know they don't have mandate from their own people. From their own people, yeah. So Erdogan, look, he's not claimed uh, to be the caliph or he's called the Khilafah. In fact, I think he was on the record to say we're not yeah. going there. We're not going. We're not even going. This is, there. That, this is another one of those Mahdi mysteries. Why do people say that? Because he's <laughs> never said it. <laughs> so, so who can be the leader? Who, who, who can be a caliph? And what's the criteria of an individual who's you know, in order for him to be validly, legitimately be a caliph for the Muslims? You know, the fundamental conditions for somebody to be a Khalifa, he just has to be Muslim, male, mature, sane, free, just, and capable, having the ability to, to rule, right? Yeah. There's a lot of other factors which are uh, can have nice to have. Mm-hmm. But this is fun. You need to be a man. You need to be a Muslim. You need to be free and sane, i.e. you're not under the control of anybody else. Everyone you're else. Understand. You're right? free. So you're independent. Yeah. You independent. can make your own. Okay, that's, so, that's fine. But look, let's be realistic here. Yeah? 100 years have gone. Yeah, I doubt anyone is left that was still here 100 years. There might be a handful of people over 100 years old, but apart from that, uh, you know, that's a long time. Essentially, you know, anybody who was there a century ago is probably not here now, or the very, very, very few. Okay, the political experience to run a country is a is, is, is far from us. The ones that are running the countries are following a different ideology or a different way, contrary to Islam. But the ones who are calling for Islam, look, whether you're Muslim Brotherhood, whether you're with Hizb Tahrir, whether you're going through the ballot box and you've, you're some Islamic party, or, 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 what, or even if you're a militant organization who wants to take the control by force, yeah, you guys ain't run a country. What do you know about running a country? This that's a very good point, actually, and it's a very good point because this is why when we talk about change, we're not talking about a revolution of completely destroying everything, right, and uh, building everything from. We're talking about seeking nusra, right? Okay. Taking power in a state that already exists, right? But for well, people at home, just explain what nusra is or seeking nusra. Nusra, nusra is taking the help of the people who have power. Because every country has people who protect that that state. Okay. So in some countries, it might be the military. In some countries, it might be the big businesses. Okay. In some countries, it might be tribal leaders, landowners, big powerful people who protect the, the rulers. Because the rulers themselves don't have the power. It's certain okay. other entity that gives them the consent. When okay. they take that consent away, that ruler has to walk. And we yeah. see that in like certain countries when the military step aside, the ruler has to leave because he's lost confidence. <laughs> so... In the Muslim world, if it's like, say, for example, the, 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 the military leaders mm-hmm. or the big tribal leaders, if they say to the king, right, you're gone, we're having Khilafah. Like Rasulullah did when he went into Medina, the Aws and Khazraj, they, the, the, they protected, they, did, they, they stood outside Medina and welcomed the Prophet in. And they said to Musaylam al-Qadhab, if you're going to object, you'll have to come and fight me. So the Prophet ﷺ went into Medina like that because he got Nusra from the Aws and Khazraj. So... When we take the power, you know, there's going to be the civil service and stuff like that that exists. All we're going to do is change the rules, but the, 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 the civil service is still going to be there. The courts are going to be there. All we do is swap the judges and put the ulama in place uh, uh, to do that. So uh, it's not a case of rebuilding everything. The education system's there. We change the policies. Mm-hmm. So the people that run the state policies, at the low level, they're probably still there running the state. What okay. we do is change the policies. So for the courts, you change the judges to Islamic judges. Yeah, of course. They have to uh, do by the, 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 the law is going to be, the f- 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 terms of reference of the law is going to change to the Quran and Sunnah. Um, education system, you've got policies again and curriculum, uh, etc. Society, social issues, how does that work? Uh, you know, in a Muslim country, by and large, mm. people at some level live an Islamic life anyway. Right? Yeah. 
So certain changes will be the dress, dress code uh, and stuff like that. But you know what? Sometimes we think, oh, we're not going to do it. We're thinking about the local Molly coming to tell us, oh, you know, come to the masjid, pray. We're thinking of that. I said, you know, oh, you can't tell me what to do. It won't be like that. It will be the state. Okay. And okay. one got... example that comes to mind. Let me give you one example. Go on, go on. You know, Iran. Okay. Right? Iran was, uh, has a deep uh, secular and almost an atheistic um, thread in that society at the time of before Ayatollah came. At the right? short time, yeah. That's why the Americans backed Ayatollah is because the communists could have taken over. So the communists had the communists had a, quite a support base in there, but they were all anti-Shah, anti-Shah. So the Americans thought, we'll back this guy. Ayatollah went there. Now, thinking about Iran being a very modern society, right? It was a very modern society, um, almost like a European city, Tehran and places like that. Ayatollah said, right, from tomorrow, all the women covered. Next day, all the women covered. So the thing is, that shows you the authority that obviously you're going to get some people not doing it, but all the time it becomes normal. It becomes normalized. You know, like me and you, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, now you see sisters, right? They wear hijab. Yeah. But they wear really, really tight uh, trousers and skirts. Really, really, right? Do they? You think, yeah. Really? Yeah. No. really? The point is this. Like, that is so obviously so wrong. Mm, okay. Sister, hijab is not just a headscarf, right? Yeah. It's, it's hiding your beauty, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when we were growing up, no Muslim woman ever dressed like that. Yeah. They might wear shalwar kameez. Maybe the head wasn't covered, but the body was covered. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, even, even the shalwar kameez was like modest in contrast. Yes. So stuff. the body was covered. You didn't see the shape of the body. Maybe yeah. the head wasn't covered. Today the head's covered, but the rest of the body showing. And it's such upside down, upside but it down. goes to show you how easily the power of society can normalize something which is not normal. So in the same way, what is meant to be correct, the power of society can make that easy. So when people or majority of the people are dressing in a particular way, most of the people will follow. Yes, the few won't, but okay. the most will follow. It's like, for example, if you go like the way we dress, mm -hmm. right? maybe mm -hmm. wear jeans, t-shirt. When we go to Pakistan or India or Bangladesh and we're sitting in the village, this comes off, lungi comes on. Yeah. yeah? Lungi comes on <laughs> because we feel comfortable. Really. And that yeah. feels normal. We wouldn't wear lungi here walking down the high street we, going to Asda. Well, even like going Saudi, going for Umrah, etc. We're there for a couple of weeks. We had with us usually for three or four weeks. Uh, when we're not doing our religious rites, it's not like we're back to normal clothes. We're just wearing the Islamic attire. Yeah. Whatever that is, in that yeah. is or in that society, I mean, look, alhamdulillah, uh, education, judiciary, uh, social issues we've just covered, economy. You know, is the Khilafah going to have what the euro, the dollar, Bitcoin? What's well, it we've be? written a, a lot about this, and you know, we could talk a, a, a lot about this as well. It's quite a detailed and thing issue, but fundamentally, Islam says the currency is based on gold and silver, something tangible, something real. And these are some simple things that people now appreciate that because Islam has mandated that the currency has to be based on some tangible stuff like gold and silver, mm -hmm. we're not going to get our markets being manipulated and these boost, boom and bust that happens in the economy now where they can just print money and cause inflation. So a lot of the illnesses in capitalism is man-made. Right. You know, a lot of the illnesses when they have their crashes, when they have the inflations, when they have all these... Uh, problems that they've had. It's man-made because of fiat currency, because of interest. Islam doesn't have that. So we don't need to solve some of their problems because they're not going to exist. Okay. This is what people are, People say, oh, brother, how are you going to solve inflation? We're not going to have it. Oh, brother, but how are you going to talk about the stock market? We're not going to have it. We've got a different way of organizing business. We've got a different way. So Islam protects us from a lot of the problems that these people are trying to fix. We're not going to have those problems. We're not going to have a lot of the problems these people have because we're going to implement the Islamic system that protects us from having some of their problems. Yes, there'll be challenges, but then that's why we have scholars in Islam to look at the text and come up with you know new creative ways of addressing some of the new Muslim countries, problems. especially Muslim countries, are very oil rich, gas rich, mineral rich. You know, we had a, a big and people still to this day remember it that in the early 70s, King Faisal over the issue of Palestine. He cut the oil supplies off to the West. And, yeah. you know, would the, would the Khilafah be in a position to 
uh, utilize its power over resources in that way? So that's a good point. Because in Islam, the resources like that belongs to the people. So they can't be privatized. Okay. So they belong to the state. So we will sell it at a proper price. You okay. know, like if you remember, I think it was King Faisal at the time, he said to the Americans, how much is a can of Coke? Mm -hmm. And how much is a liter of petrol? Can you tell me why the petrol is cheaper than a can of Coke? Mm -hmm. So they're selling it dirt cheap. Yeah. They're selling yeah. it dirt cheap. We can charge it a proper price. Therefore, we don't have to tax the people. You know, we can look after. But there's another thing people think, oh, but look, oil is the old technology. Now people are going to new, new, new energy. Mm, you know, yeah. renewable energy. Renewable energy. We're winners there again. Mm. We've got lands in our in the Muslim world which are just deserts with 12 hours of sunlight. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is just stick mirror farms all in the desert. You can generate in ele enough electricity, not just for your own people, yeah. but you know, yeah. to even give to other neighboring people and sell it. You know, and, and to think, why is it that the Muslim world, this is how backwards we are, that we don't have our own creative thinking. But in the Muslim world where you've got more sunlight, you mm -hmm. don't need to have a grid. Everybody could have solar panels and you could have solar farms. That's and the, okay, so energy. just to give our viewers a little bit of insight, a little bit of vision, okay? So we have all this energy, we have all these minerals, we have all this oil, and we sell it for gold instead of euros or dollars, yeah? Oh, we only trade in gold and silver. Only what, trade. What mm. will be, okay, let's say tomorrow that we, we switch it. Oil for gold. Where? Yeah? What's the what's the ramifications globally? Uh, ram ramification is alhamdulillah we do well because we're getting proper currency and if they don't want to buy the oil they're gonna suffer. It's like uh, Faisal said to them, isn't it? He goes, "We're desert people, you know. We drink goat's milk and herd goats. We can go back to that. We yeah, we can live with that oil. We can go back to that. You can't." They, they are so modernized and industrialized. They need that stuff. They need that stuff. Mm -hmm. They can't survive without it. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is that Achilles heel. And this is the thing people don't understand. Does that, West, mean, does that mean the balance of power can shift without a fight? Oh, yes. Potentially, yes. Potentially, absolutely. Because what people don't understand is that the West is dominant, not because the West is good. The West is dominant because they have managed to subjugate those people that can compete with them and they are looting them and robbing them and oppressing them. So they will support the tyrants to get free resources or cheap resources and then be able to sell it back to them. Still colonial model, you know, okay. take from them and sell it back to them, right? If we just said, stop that, there are many multinationals will not be able to function so because they rely upon the resources from the third world, you know? There is... If you look at it in terms of metals, Africa has most of the metals. Just to mention the third world in terms of like maybe GDP, etc., but the first world in terms of resources? This is the point I'm making. So if you go to Africa, most of the metals and natural resources is in Africa. If you look at oil and gas, Middle East, North Africa, parts of Asia, and rubber, Indonesia, Malaysia, there's lots of resources in the, in the rest of the world. If you come to Western Europe, it is starved of these resources and minerals. Western Europe and America is starved of these minerals and resources. They need the world. That's why they have aircraft carriers going around the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, in the Arab Ocean. They need to make sure that the Western world order is maintained because if that order moves, they fall. That's how drastic it is. If you change the Western world order, the economics, the global politics, they fall. And that's why by hook or by crook, they will do whatever it takes to maintain that. Wow. That's why if we have a khilaf and we break from that, I say, we're not playing that game anymore. We're taking our ball. You know, when your boys and yeah. you're in the playground, I'm taking my football. If you've got the football, there's nothing they can do. Nothing they can do about it. Yeah. And this is the thing. We're the ones but, with the football. But could they go to war? And just, just let's say Khilaf is established tomorrow. Do they just declare war and say, right, you know what? We're not having this. This is a, these guys are extremists and terrorists. We need to wipe them out. You know, the thing with the war is this. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that against you they are united, but amongst themselves they are divided. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Mm. Now, if it comes to the fact that there's going to be a war, right, every country is going to look out for their survival. All you do is you cut treaties with other deals saying, okay, we'll sell you the oil, we'll sell you the oil, you stay out, you stay out, you stay out, we'll give you three-year oil supply. 
if America... So if we're going to play people off against each other? Li- listen to this. If America, yeah. right, the superpower of the world, couldn't attack Afghanistan without the help of Pakistan. Right. Afghanistan didn't even have a proper army. It didn't have a proper air force. It had nothing. And they couldn't attack Afghanistan without the logistical support of Pakistan. Yeah, yeah but the thing is, look, look now, we're looking at now, today, yeah. That's what I'm saying. We've, we've, had, America... we've had the Taliban issue, yeah? An Islamic Emirate, as they yeah. called it, yeah? We've had the ISIS issue, yeah? Just just mm-hmm. recently um, gone, yeah? When we come out openly, the next thing, even if we do it, properly, politically, it, it takes to have a caliph appointed, pledge allegiance, do everything with all the formalities. The minute you say we have an Islamic caliphate, the alarm bells are going to be like more than before. They're like, because these guys just came out and said it. Mm-hmm. The thing is, look, when we have the Khilafah established, it's not going to be on some, you know, street corner. It's, it, the, the whole point of the Nusra is, and this we learn from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mm. That when he visited the tribe, he checked their capabilities. Are you capable of defending and protecting? Uh-huh. So when we establish a Khilafah, it's going to be on a basis of, do we have the capability to defend the state? Mm. So if tomorrow, if Sultan of Brunei comes, come, you can establish Khilafah here. We'll say no, because you can't defend that little bit of land with mm. five people. Yeah. You, know, you need to have a landmass with an army and ability to feed your people and to defend your people. Right? So there's countries like Turkey, Pakistan, Egypt, Syria, yeah, Iraq. That's, Lama, that's, big that's what I find. Even if you talk about big countries, let's say even Iraq. Look, Iraq has been carpet bombed. The, the weaponry, military technology has gone so advanced. Well, but look, they just look, need look, to look. just uh, throw war planes over and just drop bomb, 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 bomb and we're finished. No, but this is, this is the thing was when, uh, when they attacked Afghanistan and mm. Iraq, uh, it was against one puppet regime being attacked by all the other puppet, puppet regimes puppet by the regimes, yeah. It's different when it's the Islamic State because the sympathies of the people is with Islam. Yeah, but look, okay. So that's, those that's, countries, those countries. But look, okay, let's say it's, yeah, it's established in Jordan and Syria, um, maybe Iraq or whatever. You know, the Saudi regime is going to be against us because they don't want to think you because they like, how you can't have this. All the North African countries, Egypt, Libya, are going to be against. All the other root because, you, like you said, it's going to start in one place and then spread. So all the other, even the Muslim countries, or even the even the leaders of the other Muslim countries, ain't going to be happy that the Khilafah is established. No, but this is this is the point you, you're missing because you're trying to understand what's going to happen then with the mindset now. Now. Right? <laughs> So it's, it's difficult to do. You need to have the mindset then to see what's going to happen. And it, again, it's difficult to do that. So yes, all I can say to you is try and compare with like with like. Mm. So, you know, like, yes, when Saddam Hussein uh, uh, became an enemy for the Americans, or they, yeah. they basically set him up. Yeah. Um, the thing we need to remember is when he got attacked, right, in the last minute he's tried now to appeal to the Muslim sentiment. Remember, he put Allahu Akbar on the flag. The flag changed all, overnight, yeah. yeah. Suddenly, the, he's been fighting Islam all his life, and now suddenly, when death comes knocking on his door, he puts Allahu Akbar on the flag, right? <laughs> Why? Because he knows the only thing that can arouse the Muslims around the world is the Islamic sentiment. Mm-hmm. So, th- this is it. Now, he did sloganeering. If that happens for real, it will have a, a, yeah, a, a we're, real we're difference. Yeah, we following the slogan. It will yeah. have a real difference. And you will find people in the Muslim world it will be reluctant to fight that because it's, it's easy to spin off somebody said, oh, this is ISIS. Oh, this is Saddam Hussein. Oh, this is this. When Islam does come for real, right? And you got ulama because Nusra will be not just by the military. It will be like great scholars saying, yes, we accept this is Khilafah. We accept this is Khilafah. Then it gets difficult for, the, for these countries to function and to keep their people united against them. They're going to fracture, especially the, the tin pot states. They are going to start the fracture because they know the time is up. The clock is ticking. So do I run now? Or do I try and fight and survive and die? And die, yeah. So they've got to make those calculations. Yeah, and like you said, some of them you'd have the debts ready for that day. They have, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> the reality. That's not even a joke. That's not it's even a joke. You know, I mean? uh, you know and there's, there's quite a few uh, countries I'd like to see where they have those jets ready, even now. Uh, just a bit of... It's, it's fear, isn't it? Once they think, oh, shit, you know what? The people are moving. Now's the time to get on the plane. That means that 
who do, who do they fear? You know, it makes you think. No, but if you if you notice in Egypt, when the masses came out on the street in Egypt, even the army was reluctant to attack the people at that point. Yeah, yeah. Because they've got a similar emotion when it comes to that. It's okay then, but afterwards they, they, they sorted all of that out and got people off the streets. Yeah, but it goes yeah. to show that they are not, that people actually, many people in the armed forces actually think they're doing good, that they're doing something good for the cause of Islam or whatever. Okay. But when it obvious it's not, they're not going to support regimes. We, we mentioned previously that the, the hadith that Islam started as something strange and return as something strange. There's also another narration, again, we're just paraphrasing here, we're not we're quoting verbatim, but then at the beginning you'd have a Khilafah Rashida, then we won't, then we have different types of oppressive and uh, yeah, all the different types of rules which uh, didn't don't quite meet the standard. But in the end, in the end, we'll go back to uh, Khilafah Rashida, Khilafah on the methodology of the the prophethood. Yeah, so so, so we it's absent now. Looking forward, we're supposed to have a Khilafah Rashida again. You know what's that going to look like? You know these are milestones. Mm. So when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the the prophethood is with you as long as Allah wills, then this will go. Then there'll be yeah. Khilafah Rashida. Then we we'll go. Then there'll be the monarchy and oppressive rule. These are all milestones, right? We don't know how long each one's going to last. last and the point last. is, we know they've all passed. Well, the, we know they've yeah, all passed. The, of the last one, yeah. Except the last. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us the Khilafah is coming. It's a done deal. Whether we can imagine it or not, it's irrelevant. It's going to happen. Whether we're going to work for it or not, it's irrelevant. It's going to happen. It's a done deal. Like the way Salah had been liberated Al-Aqsa, like the way uh, Muhammad al-Fatih liberated Istanbul, they were written... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote that down before the world was created. It's going to happen. Khilafah is going to happen. right? Whether we like it or we can imagine it or not, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So, so for the viewers at home, let's wrap this up, Mazal. Yeah. What's the way forward for look, people for like you? the viewers me? at home, look, you need to understand. I mean, the, it's, Khilafah is so central to Islam. Khilafah is what Islam looks like when it's applied. Right? So people say, where is Islam? There is no Islam. Yeah, there's Muslims, there's Salah, there's Masajid, there's, there's, you know, there's hijab and there's this and there's that. But what does Islam look like when it is implemented? That is what the Khilafah is. And the Khilafah affects every aspect of our ibadah. It affects every aspect of Islam. Collection of zakat, distribution of zakat, baytul mal, you know, uh, going out in the Maidan of Arafat is the responsibility of the Khalif. Uh, Juma praise is connected with the Khilafah. It affects our every day-to-day -day Islam. We cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he told us to worship him without the Khilafah existing. That's what we need to understand. The thing is this, if Islam is so central, why do we know so little about it? Why do we know? Why do we not talk about it? And this is the problem. We need to revive the idea of this Khilafah in us. We need to understand what is the Khilafah. And then within our abilities and capabilities, we need to do whatever it takes and just to close with, to show you the importance of this. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, we know we have to bury the dead as soon as you can. And we know that to bury the Prophet is easier than any man because a Prophet is buried wherever they die. You don't even have to take the body to the, to the graveyard. You bury right. them where they pass away. Yeah. Yet, the Sahaba had a consensus on delaying the burial of the Prophet because they went to appoint the Khalifa. When Umar radiallahu anhu was dying, he gave three days to appoint the next Khalifa. And he said, if after three days they still dispute, and who's he talking about when he says they? He's talking about the six from the Ashraf al Mubashir, the best of the best of the best. And he said, it's after three days, one of them disagrees, kill him. And the Sahaba remained silent, Ijma as Sahaba, meaning the unity of the Ummah is more important than the life of the best companions. So that's how wow. important the Khilafah is. That's how important and central the Khilafah is. We need to know that. And if you don't know it, go to your masjids, go to your ulama and ask them, why have you not told us about this? Why have you not told about this when your forefathers from India are the ones who were the defenders of the Khilafah in the Khilafat movement? Absolutely. And, uh, the, even, even if you go back to Shah Waliullah, yeah. where both the Deobandis yeah. and the Barilwis emanate from. Yeah. He was a defender of the Khilafah and said it's an obligation. That's what, so why know, do we not? We have the disagreement between the Diobadis and the Brailwis and they both 
go back to him in you. some respect. And I just said, just forget your differences. Unite, unite on the common denominator, yeah. Shawali Allah. Absolutely. Forget Absolutely. your differences. And, you know, we have such a rich and proud heritage with regards to the Khilafah from the Indian subcontinent. Why yeah. is it that we here know so little about it? Mm -hmm. We were the champions of it. And again, we become the champions. Because remember what I said at the beginning. Yeah. The Khilafah is not in any particular place for any particular land. There is no reason why the Khilafah can't emerge in Pakistan, in, uh, in, in that land, and then the, liberate the rest of the world from there. There's no reason why that can't happen. So we should compete that we want the honor. We should compete that we want the honor of the Khilafah where we are. So we should, the people in Pakistan should feel motivated that we have the ability, one of the few places on earth that could actually establish a Khilafah and it's got the means to support and defend itself and carry the message to the four corners of the world. So people in Pakistan, you know, they should think, what can we do? If you know people in Pakistan, you've got a friend in the army, influential people, talk to them. Talk to them. Why is it that we don't embrace our destiny? Embrace what is going to happen. And, you know, write new history. Destiny. We read about Salah al-Din, we read about Muhammad al-Fadi, yeah. but in years to come, people read about the, the heroes of this era who established the Khilafah in the same way they talk about Salah al-Din and Muhammad al-Fadi. So we should have our names on those pages of history. That's what our young should be thinking about. Okay, folks at home, uh, we've had uh, Brother Mazar Khan talking about the Khilafah. It's uh, been 100 years, it's been absent. And inshallah, you know, we pray Allah subhanahu wa doesn't wait to make us wait another hundred years. I mean, I mean, inshallah. Brother Mazar, Jazakallah for coming onto the show and giving us your time. Thank you for having me and Barakallah. Barakallah. Okay, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah.